1895, when Wilhelm Röntgen successfully produced and detected X-rays, William Crookes, whose Crookes tubes Röntgen had employed in his discovery, speculated that this new kind of invisible light was connected to supernatural phenomena. Hypothetically, the ether, which contained countless channels of communication, also sustained ghost light, invisible to the naked eye, and acted as a medium that allowed ethereal bodies to rise up. In other words, the same matter through which light and electrical signals passed was envisaged as the same substance which allowed spirits to fluctuate between observable and imperceptible forms. These early links between the invisible zones of the electromagnetic spectrum and the occult made way for late 19th and early 20th century associations between electricity, radiation, and ancient Egypt, which, through its reputation as the birthplace of magic, was central to conceptions of the supernatural. So this paper investigates these connections, emphasizing the way in which the ancient civilization symbolized and was explained by the imagery and language intrinsic to this aspect of early 20th century modernity. More specifically, its analysis of how ancient Egypt was viewed through the lens of physics and vice versa reveals a broader trend that saw the modern defined by its relationship to antiquity, cutting-edge science aligned with alchemy, and a peculiar exchange between the concepts of modern scientists and ancient god. So um, I'm going to address electrical phenomena, x-rays, and the developments in the understanding of radioactivity. And I'm going to use text by H. Ryder Haggard and Bram Stoker. Haggard's short story, Smith and the Pharaohs, which was serialized between 1912 and 1913, reveals the influence of scientific showmanship and electrical light displays. And Stoker's novel, The Jewel of Seven Stars, which was first published in 1903 and then reissued with an alternate ending in 1912, turns processes of analysing mummies through X-ray radiographs on their heads. The mummy becomes scientist and its funerary paraphernalia become emitters of radiation. Throughout the 19th century, and with varying degrees of seriousness, public figures suggested that the ancient Egyptians had known of electricity. The astronomer Norman Lockyer, for example, wrote about his experiences examining Egyptian sites in the dawn of astronomy in 1894. Looking for evidence that ancient Egyptian labourers had worked by torchlight, he notes that in all the freshly opened tombs there are no traces whatever of any kind of combustion having taken place, even in the innermost recesses. Unable to explain the lack of evidence of more elementary light sources, Lockyer recounts how he and his companion joked of the possibility that the electric light was known to the ancient Egyptians. The inventor, Werner von Siemens, had possibly a more kind of supernaturally charged experience, and um, it was his company that manufactured the Crookes tubes with which Röntgen studied x-rays. So um, in the 1860s, he was atop the Great Pyramid on holiday, and he recounted the story in his personal recollections of 1893. And when one of his Arab guides lifted his um, hand atop the Great Pyramid, um, there was a sharp singing sound, um, which ceased as soon as he lowered his hand. Siemens himself felt a prickling sensation and a slight electric shock as he attempted to drink from a wine bottle. And in a moment of inspired ingenuity, he fashioned the wine bottle into a rudimentary Leiden jar, which he charged by holding it aloft, producing loud cracking sparks. One of the Arabs, believing the static electricity to be the result of magic, attacked, provoking Siemens to use the bottle as an electrical weapon. When touched on the nose, the Arab fell speechless to the ground, and several seconds elapsed before, with a sudden cry, he raised himself and sprang howling down the steps of the pyramid. <laughs> with theatrical execution, Siemens harnesses the, the pyramid's unusual electrical properties, adopting a role somewhere between stage magician and physicist, which is something that was also happening in 19th century cities for paying audiences. So by the late 19th century, electricity had emerged as one of the most thrilling tools put to use by scientists, whose demonstrations were in direct competition with theatres, panoramas, dioramas, and magic lantern shows, among various other visual spectacles. Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American physicist and engineer, was stunning audiences with his extraordinary displays of electrical mastery, where flamboyant showmanship transformed his demonstrations into mag magical spectacles. As Graham Gooday notes, electricity was often anthropomorphized, with personifications taking the form of goddesses, fairies, wizards, genies, and imps. And Tesla encouraged his own depiction of, as one of these types, which was the wizard, and which had a striking impact on depictions of magical light effects in literature, and in my opinion, in literature concerning ancient Egypt um, in particularly interesting ways. So in 1892, Tesla's celebrated lecture on fluorescent light at the Royal Institution secured his reputation as one of the great scientific showmen of the age. Although contemporary reports vary in style, they express a general sense of awe at the effects that Tesla produced. 
While the resultant article in Scientific American sticks mainly to the impartial terminology of scientific observation, they record um, a blue phosphorescent light and sparks obtained over a distance of one and a quarter inches. So at the end of the article, there's this kind of outburst um, where he can't contain um, what Tesla does with an impartial scientific language. Um, so he says, The lecturer took in his hand a glass wand, three feet long, and with no special connection of any sort to his body or to the glass, when waved in the magnet field, it shone like a flaming sword. Tesla's displays could not be fully explained via the language of scientific description as parallels were drawn between his apparatus and fantastical magical implements, and by association, Tesla seems himself a kind of sorcerer. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the picture on the right. Um, Tesla was um, encouraging these kind of uh, crazy pictures of himself with lots of electrical sparks going on, which actually um, double exposures. Um, so he wasn't actually sitting there when that was taken. But he was um, sending these pictures out to magazines, and his image was being broadcast like that. It was like some kind of... He seems really chilled out. <laughs> <laughs> a really laid-back guy with all this crazy electrical stuff going on around him. And um, this illustration is from an article entitled The New Wizard of the West, which was published in Pearson's, and I think it's doing a similar thing. Uh, so we get uh, Tesla described as an audacious wizard, and his, his um, laboratory is a miracle factory, and he summons a ball of leaping red flame by snapping his fingers. He makes the darkened laboratory glow with a strange light as beautiful as that of the moon, but as bright as sunlight, and he emerges from the darkness with an illuminated halo formed by myriads of tongues of electric flame emerging from his own body. So this illustration itself encourages um, the kind of dual depiction of Tesla as modern scientist and a master of ancient alchemical knowledge, which is reproduced in the syntax of this, which thankfully we can see underneath, please replace the lamp, um, <laughs> Nikola Tesla holding in his hands balls of flame. So this kind of deliberately archaic sentence structure um, encourages this kind of antiquated view of something that's actually very modern. And Tesla is meant to symbolise a kind of timeless enlightenment simultaneously existing within modern and ancient worlds. Um, so Graham Gooday says something really nice about Tesla, so I'm going to copy it. Um, so he says that Tesla Magus like was encouraging an image of himself as a manipulator of lightning and prophet of the most spectacular electrical technologies. Um, so here we, we again see these religious connotations Holding orbs of light in his hands or emitting huge sparks from his own body that create the illuminative appearance of a halo, Tesla's intention is clear, to enrapture and beguile with scientific exhibition, combined with grandiose ceremonious showmanship, one which presented the physical as the magical and the scientist as the enchanter. So turning to literature now, I think the influence of such showmanship can be read in the scientific romances of the period, which often combined electrical and supernatural themes. And Haggard Smith and the Pharaohs makes an interesting case study as it appears to explicitly draw upon descriptions of Tesla's impressive electrical performances, uniting modern concepts with ancient spiritual subjects. So in Haggard's tale, Smith is an amateur Egyptologist and he finds himself locked in the Cairo Museum overnight. Um, so he's walking around trying to find somewhere to sleep um, and walks into the central hall where all the mummies are stored. In the darkness of the central hall, he finds that the mummies have actually turned into ghosts and um, they're forming a great congregation. The phantoms stand in ranks facing the god Osiris, who stares out from the top of a flight of steps, emitting a spectral glow. The room is brightened by the pale and ghostly light, which, like the light Tesla summoned on stage, is described as having a blue tinge. As the light increases in intensity, it shoots out in long tongues which join themselves together, illuminating all that huge hall. And this light later takes the form of a blue spark, which transforms into upward pouring rays. These strange luminous shapes are eerily reminiscent of descriptions of Tesla's fluorescent light, and the positioning of Osiris and the spirits echoes the setup of the lecture hall, with Tesla at the front and his eager audience facing him in rows. Indeed, much of the imagery and terminology is replicated from press reports of Tesla's demonstrations, particularly the tongues of light and the religious parallels between Tesla's and Osiris's light-producing bodies. If Haggard was indeed influenced by Tesla, then he elevates the scientist's position of a god standing before a worshipful audience. Simultaneously, the ethereal light symbolising ancient magic is aligned with very modern ways in which electricity could be manipulated. Haggard's merging of the powers of the mortal scientist and immortal god, modernity and antiquity, is striking and reveals the extent to which Victorian and Edwardian electrical display was ingrained in visual culture and evoked the forgotten powers of antiquity. This, however, was not restricted to electricity as visible light, 
but was apparent in discussions of other kinds of electromagnetic radiation, including invisible X-rays. So higher in frequency than waves of the visible spectrum, X-rays produced seemingly ghostly images that depicted the body as it would appear after death. As a result, they had strong supernatural connotations, and there was speculation by some, including Crooks, by this time the president of the Society for Psychical Research, that they were related to telepathy. Their visual similarities to spirit photographs with these kind of translucent flesh outlines and skeletal motifs meant that as soon as the first X-ray radiographs were produced, they were regarded as new tools in the effort to prove the existence of the spirit world, and they furthered late 19th and early 20th century fascination with spiritualism. Just months after Redfin's discovery, X-ray radiographs of mummified remains were produced for the first time. This is the, the um, X-ray of a mummy child. They were done in Germany just um, in 1896. And the technique proved popular with some of the era's most eminent Egyptologists. Gaston Maspero, the director of the Cairo Museum, had the mummy of Thutmose IV examined using Egypt's only X-ray equipment in 1903. Grafton Elliot Smith, the anatomist who carried out the procedure, likely serves as inspiration for the protagonist J.E. Smith in Smith and the Pharaohs. The similarities between the two men's names, the setting of the Cairo Museum, and this passing reference where, in which Haggard um, compares the glare of the mummies when they find them out to that of a Röntgen ray all implies that Haggard was using Smith as inspiration. Further evidence lies in the similarities between Maspero and Haggard's unnamed director of the museum. They're both um, very similar in that they're quite fun, jolly characters. They're both French, and they don't mind people taking the really, really um, priceless artefacts that they find on digs and keeping them for themselves. Um, the parallels are all the more striking, considering that Maspero was still the Cairo Museum's director when Haggard wrote the story in 1912, which was the same year that Smith's study of the museum's mummies were published, and he'd unwrapped these mummies between 1881 and 1905, but it wasn't in 1912 when it was published. Yet Haggard's failed allusions to real people with an interest in X-raying mummies are minor when compared to Bram Stoker's reliance upon developments in theories of radiation when writing The Jewel of Seven Stars. Stoker first published his novel in 1903, the year in which pioneers in the field of radioactivity Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, and Henri Becquerel jointly received the Nobel Prize in Physics. It was also the year in which Ernest Rutherford and Frederick Soddy explained the concept of radioactive decay, and in which Crookes invented the spin thoroscope for observation of the process. And Stoker alludes to a number of recent scientific discoveries in this field to add academic credence to his reimagining of the classic mummy reanimation plot. The experiment requires magical artifacts and the sarcophagus of Queen Terra to be arranged to recreate the magnetic, electric, and radioactive conditions that were present in Terra's original Egyptian tomb um, in a place which is based on the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Sorcerer. If successful, the fanatical Egyptologist Abel Trelawney hopes that they will be able to let in on the world of modern science such a flood of light from the old world as will change every condition of thought and experiment and practice. And throughout the novel, Otherworldly Light symbolises the mysterious nature of ancient Egyptian power, which hovers at the nexus between science and sorcery. Trelawney believes that the ancient Egyptians possessed a knowledge beyond what our age has ever known, and as a result, um, bringing terror back to light would revolutionise modern, the modern world through its advancement of scientific understanding. And of these objects which are arranged um, in the laboratory, um, one is particularly important. This is a magic coffer which glows from within. And Stoker um, implies the coffer responds to radiation, including Röntgen and cathode and Becquerel rays, and that the newly discovered substances, radium, helium, polonium, and argon, may be involved in contributing to its unusual properties. Um, and this coffer glows when special lamps are lit, and these lamps contain cedar oil, described as having a particular refractive effect on the light. The flames of the lamps burn with a slow, steady light growing more and more bright and changing in colour from blue to crystal white. And so this light already, already signified as unusual through its changes in hue and intensity acts similar to X-rays. When the light interacts with the magic coffer, it shines with a delicate glow which increase, increases in luminosity until it appears like a blazing jewel which emits a faint greenish vapour. An exaggerated version of the fluorescent screens that Röntgen observed glowing faintly green when exposed to X-rays and which became staple tools in investigations into radioactivity the coffer demonstrates the ways in which ancient Egyptian technologies, which may seem magical to the unfamiliar, quite literally outshine contemporary scientific equipment. Kate Hebblethwaite notes that the concept of transmutation also appears to have played a part in Stoker's plot. 
suggesting that Terra's resurrection is a spiritual version of Rutherford and Soddy's theory of the conversion of one chemical element into another through nuclear reaction. She argues that in the original ending of the text, the Queen takes possession of Margaret's body, her spirit moving from one medium to the other. While the theory of transmutation was also proposed in 1903, making this concept's influence on the text incredibly up-to-date, I think there is something much more ancient at work. At the time, both transmutation and x-rays were closely associated with alchemy. Rutherford and Soddy's discovery was often illustrated by ancient alchemical emblems, such as the Ouroboros. And as a legendary science with its origins in ancient Egypt, the transformation of one woman into another appears to be part of a greater alchemical mythology. Terra's ruby scarab placed over her heart during the experiment acts as the philosopher's stone, converting death to life by providing the queen's spirit with a younger body, mirroring contemporary depictions of radium as a miraculous healing agent, the elixir of life, or perhaps even the legendary stone itself. There is also a case for the argument that, like Haggard, who fashioned the Egyptian god Osiris as a kind of ancient Tesla, Stoker drew upon real scientists as inspiration. The similarities between Marie Curie and Queen Terra are striking. Curie was depicted romantically by the press, driven to discover forces that were enigmatic and hidden, and created beautiful and eerie effects such as luminescence, colour changes in gems, and unexpected chemical reactions. And Curie's unusual status as a female pioneering scientist and the disparity between her unobtrusive and delicate demeanour and her phenomenal achievements only served to further public fascination with her and her work. As women at the forefront of their respective sciences, which themselves seem to be closely related, Curie and Terra appear to have much in common. While a number of critics have already identified the cryptic encoding of Terra's name within that of her English doppelganger, Margaret Trelawney's, linking the novel's female characters with Curie reveals yet another facet to Stoker's nameplay. The similarities between Margaret and Marie point to a close connection between the novel's female characters and this contemporary scientist. The Jewel of Seven Stars contributed to the generic movement away from ancient Egypt as subject matter for the Gothic romance towards science fiction. Haggard followed suit, retrospectively offering an explanation for the life-giving pillar of fire in She, based on the discovery of radium in his unimaginatively titled sequel, Aisha, The Return of She, a couple of years after the publication of Soka's novel. As a civilization whose remnants and mortal remains were being re-examined in the light of radical scientific techniques, ancient Egypt's association with the modern scientific process and radical new media such as the X-ray radiograph, itself strongly associated with spiritualism, was inevitable. Marjorie C. Mallet even suggests that spiritualism and occultism more generally prepared society to accept the newly discovered rays and the ghostly images they produced. Just as physics encouraged ideas of occultism, so occultism readied the mind to accept revolutionary scientific concepts. So to bring this paper swiftly towards a conclusion, credited with an unparalleled aptitude in such magical science as its alchemy, ancient Egypt seemed to be antiquity's counterpart to the incredible spectacles produced by modern trailblazing scientists whose experiments offered tantalizing possibilities of communion with the spirit world. As a result, modern scientific developments that appeared to approach the unreachable heights of alchemy were often best described in ancient terms. Glowing colored tubes become glass wands. Brilliant sparks became biblical tongues of flame. The more miraculous science seemed to be, the closer the scientists became to a magus or even a god. And the use of the image and theory behind contemporary science in these texts thus hints at a greater hope that continued study of antiquity might lead to similarly revolutionary advances in occult science, which would make accessible the ghosts of the past, and draw their unsurpassed ancient knowledge off the pages of literature and back into the modern world. Thank you.